Matt, we are live. Hello, everyone, and welcome. Thanks for joining us. My name is Matthew Ferrara, and today I'm your host for a very special webinar by Realogy, the first in a series of webinars that we have put together, uh, bringing together the insights, best practices, and ongoing analysis by leaders and analysts from across the Realogy franchise group and its brands and network worldwide. We really appreciate you taking some time to join us for this conversation. The goal is to bring together the industry as a whole and to share ideas, best practices, resources, and tips that will help us all navigate the current crisis and not only perhaps uh, get through it, but emerge even better uh, and stronger as vital parts of our local, our national, and the global e economy. It's Realogy's belief, of course, that at a time like this, all of its leadership experiences and resources should be marshaled to help every brokerage and the industry as a whole, uh, both nationally and worldwide, learn, act, and ultimately get better uh, with any help that it can provide. Today, I'm joined for a conversation by two industry experts uh, for what I think is a very important and insightful conversation on what's not just happening in our markets, but how brokers are responding what actions they're taking, what resources are available to them, and specifically here in America, uh, a little bit of focus on the CARES stimulus package and how it can be of help as well. Uh, first, uh, I wanted to introduce our uh, two panelists, and I'll tell you a little bit about how the conversation will go and how you can also participate in today's um, conversation. Uh, joining me first is, of course, John Payton. Uh, he is the president and CEO of Realogy Franchise Group. Uh, John is responsible for managing Realogy's portfolio of brands, which include Coldwell Banker, Century 21, Better Homes and Gardens, Sotheby's International Realty, ERA, and other brands, as well as the Realogy Brokerage Group, uh, featuring some of those brands. We, uh, John is responsible for the organization's uh, overview of uh, more than 16,000 offices and over 300,000 affiliated sales associates in more than 100 countries worldwide. Uh, John's role, of course, is to guide growth, to uh, focus on expansion worldwide, and also to help create the conditions in which the industry as a whole can thrive. He's also uh, been twice named to the Swanepoel Top 200 Most Influential uh, People in Real Estate list, and his background includes extensive experience at Starwood Hotels and Resorts, where he made a name for himself in global branding and uh, brings that experience to bear on his, his role at Realogy. Also joining me today will be Steve Weibo, a senior restructuring and management consultant professional at Conway McKenzie with more than two decades of experience in providing turnaround, reorganization, mergers and acquisition, and financial advisory services to underperforming um, or distressed companies. Steve's focus is financial and operational uh, management services in real estate, as well as other segments of the economy. And he served as interim chief financial officer, chief restructuring officer, and other key C-suite roles for many middle market companies. Steve's also been elected uh, as one of the uh, turnaround and workouts people to watch by D Business Magazine, as well as other awards in his career. You're gonna really enjoy the conversation with these two today, I'm sure. And uh, I believe that you'll find it both important and insightful. Before we begin, I want to invite all of you to uh, uh, please feel free to interact by using the Q&A button, uh, which is at the bottom of your toolbar. You'll be able to submit questions, and uh, we will, if we have time at the end, try to get to as many of those as possible. So please don't hesitate to submit those questions. We'll do our very best to try and um, 
uh, to get to them. Also, the session will be recorded. So uh, you will have the ability to watch the recording again. You'll receive a link at the address with which you registered for today's session, and you'll be able to replay it at your own pace or share it with any other brokerage you feel could benefit from today's conversation uh, and insights. And we will have a survey at the end, plus I'll give you the link to a website of additional resources uh, that are applicable to the, the current unprecedented times that Realty has okay. put together for you. So again, let me just welcome our two hosts, John and Steve, thanks for being with us today. Thank you, Matthew. Thanks, Matt. And let me just jump right in and start with you, John. Um, the real estate industry is responding quickly uh, to the impact uh, that the coronavirus has made on it as brokerage, uh, brokerage operations and agents. Um, obviously, it has been quite a disruption to many of their plans and operations. Uh, talk about the big picture for just a moment here and how the industry as a whole is reacting. Sure. I, I think the big picture is we're all in this together, whether as um, a society or as families or as um, realtors um, who are members of the Realty family or not. And one of the reasons we're doing a call like this is because as an industry leader, um, we want to offer our advice and expertise because um, we want a really strong um, real estate industry to um, emerge on the other side of this crisis. I think we've got over 300 um, companies that have joined us today um, who are from outside the Realogy network. And it's a great example of, of together and, and supporting each. I hope everybody is well, wherever you are self quarantining. Um, I'm calling into this from Weston, Connecticut, which is about an hour north of, of New York City. Uh, so, you know, it, everything is affected by this, right? It's, it goes without saying that brokerage operations, how listings are now marketed, uh, the transitions that agents are making to um, virtual showings and contacting their clients um, via video, um, the way in which transactions are closing, um, how each state and jurisdiction is taking a different approach to real estate being essential or not essential. There's so much um, happening. Um, and, and one of the things that, that Realogy, because of its size and scale and influence, um, you know, is, is we, we are really on the front lines of advocating for the industry. So, you know, our CEO, um, his name is Ryan Schneider. He is um, in contact with all of the White House task forces, and he has been commenting um, and, in, and uh, representing our point of view on behalf of the industry about what we think the federal relief program should look like. He's also very involved with the, the National Chamber of Commerce leaders. He's a member, he's a former banker, so he's very connected to the banking community. And so um, we're very connected with, with those federal efforts influencing where they're going. Um, our general counsel is very connected with NAR and helping NAR really set policy um, and, give, and give guidance. And so, you know, behind the scenes, we're doing a lot to help the um, support that the federal government and state and local are, are doing. Let's talk a little bit about some of the proactive, like the immediate reactions and the work that Realogy is doing uh, proactively for its uh, owned operations and its affiliates um, and all of the uh, sales associates and, of course, ultimately their clients as well. You know, what, are, what have been some of the immediate steps that you've taken and how uh, can they be examples of, of steps that others uh, could take as well? Yeah, sure. So just to go a little bit deeper on, you know, our, um, what we're advocating for at state and federal levels, Matt, you know, like I said, we are talking to the White House, the U.S. Chamber of Commerce, the American Bankers Association, um, all of the Washington groups, as well as with NAR, et cetera. You know, our priorities for the last six weeks have been, you know, number one, to ensure that independent contractors were included in the income relief bills. And um, I, I, I'm saying we collectively, those representing independent contractors, um, we were successful with that. Um, we were obviously advocating for robust relief for small businesses, you know, and we think we made good progress there. Um, and then we really worked hard to make sure that local jurisdictions understand that um, closing a real estate transaction is an important business activity and should be considered an essential service. We think it should be done remotely and safely. Um, but we've, we've worked hard to make sure, like, for example, in Pennsylvania, where initially 
uh, the state said real estate transactions could not go forward. We worked to um, loosen those restrictions. You know, so we're working at the state and county level um, through our title businesses and our insurance businesses to make sure that li literally like local recording offices, uh, Matt and county agents are moving quickly to digital solutions to enable us to keep um, business going. Um, you know, Realogy's fortunate because we've got a title business, we have a mortgage business, which gets very local very fast, and we can leverage those relationships to help um, keep transactions moving. Um, and we're doing our best to help agents navigate what can be confusing and conflicting guidance about sheltering in place. And so, um, you know, our guidance is number one, follow local ordinances, but most importantly, you know, we have told um, as you said in the introduction, we, we um, are the largest owned brokerage in the U.S. In, across Corcoran, Sotheby's International Realty, and Cobble Banker, as well as the largest franchisor. For our own brokerages, we have uh, closed our offices, our employees are all working from home, and our agents are highly encouraged to not come into the office. We've made the event available should they need some, something or a file or something like that. Um, but we are we are very um, clearly and assertively telling everyone to work from home. Um, we're also discouraging open houses and things like that. And if an if an agent does choose to do an open house, um, we are asking them to get permission in writing from the owner of that home to put in place protocols that we all know pretty well by now. And we've given agents um, advice on that as well. So you know that's what we're doing at the at the advocacy level, you know, specifically what, what are, we're encouraging our affiliates to do and what we're doing as well at our own brokerages, you know, the first thing to do is to scour your P&L and to, you know, batten down the hatches in terms of expenses and payroll, um, et cetera. So, you know, Realogy at the corporate level, if you've read about what we've done, we have been um, uh, proactive in, in, in furloughing um, employees et cetera, to make sure that we have the financial wherewithal to, you know, endure this as long as it occurs and, and local offices are doing the same. So, you know, this is a time to make very difficult decisions about um, reducing your payroll, um, reducing your footprint, dialing back on marketing. If, you know, in fact, um, there isn't a lot of business out there. What we're seeing nationally, Matt, is about a 40% year over year reduction in, um, you know, opens and new listings. Um, and that number seems to be plateauing in the last week to 10 days. So don't know if it will dip again, but at the moment it seems to be at 40 and it can range anywhere from 20% down to 75% down, depending on the market. Manhattan would be a good example of 75% of down. You know, and the last thing that we're doing is we are, we're doubling down on um, our, our taking all of our training and making it as virtual as possible. Um, each of our brands has been doing multiple training sessions for agents. We're encouraging agents to get back to basics, do their training and learning when they're slower. And we've literally been doing um, virtual training um, and having thousands of agents on each of these sessions, um, which we do by brand. Um, so Caldwell Banker, for example, had a training session for agents with 4,000 agents on it um, earlier this week. Um, which which um, is much better than we do in, in normal times. So agents have got time on their hands, and so we're making sure that we have great content and and training um, for them. Um, and the last thing I would say is that we are on literally calling each and every one of our affiliates and making sure that they have applied for all of the federal relief that they are um, um, uh, uh, eligible for. And if they're not aware of it or how to do it, we're we're pointing them to the right resources for that. And I think that that's, I mean, that's a comprehensive, I mean, very comprehensive list, obviously using the resources you have, using the ability to leverage um, operational efficiencies and the technologies that are available, keeping people connected, um, taking a look at not only expenses, but perhaps there are opportunities to tap into savings that, you know, you hadn't explored before. So I know, for example, Realogy and many organizations like realtor organizations have, uh, affinity programs and uh, opportunities for people to, you know, take a look at uh, how they can get better pricing on things. And then, of course, sharpening the saw, right? Using this time to get together, using this time to learn, to be able to perhaps uh, expand our skill sets, something we can work on while there are other things that, you know, we might not be able to 
um, you know, leveraging the tools that we have and, uh, and to, not looking at this necessarily as just you know, time off, but more like game on, if you will, for us to excel where we can. Let me, um, Absolutely. Let me use that it's as a, a transition point, maybe, because I love that you, you, know, you, you also referenced taking a look at what re financial resources are available. And you, you, know, you point out that Realogy is on the forefront of talking with policymakers and immediately trying to be involved in that conversation and making sure that it is extended to what might not have traditionally we've seen a financial stimulus uh, or rescue package extend to, which is an industry that's highly dominated by small entrepreneurs, medium entrepreneurs, and a lot of independent contractors. This might be a good time for me to bring Steve into the conversation. Steve, I wanna um, ask you, based on your experience, based on all of the things that you've seen in the past, and also the conversations you're having with organizations right now, what should brokers be focused on in the crisis and how does that tie into policy that we're seeing coming out of governments and obviously in the case of, of uh, the United States, the CARES Act and the stimulus package. Sure. Thanks, Matt. I appreciate you uh, hosting this afternoon. I want to thank John and the rest of the Realogy team for letting me uh, participate today. I worked with Realogy and many franchisees over the last 15 plus years. So it's, it's an honor to be here and appreciate the time. Um, I've got a uh, kind of a five-step uh, approach and like every other uh, management consultant, I've got a PowerPoint, which may or may not come up on the screen here. Um, it's not necessary. Uh, well, there it is for those of you that are looking online. Um, and I'll ask uh, the moderator to just flip through. I, I won't get too bogged down in the details, but maybe focus on this page for a minute. Um, I, I've talked to, it's probably my sixth or seventh uh, webinar in the last couple of weeks and talked to many different uh, industries. I, I live in, happen to live outside of Detroit, so I've talked to the automotive uh, association. I've talked to uh, construction uh, and some other uh, industry trade groups in different industries. And what I, really the message is the same, and I'll get a little bit granular on certainly the brokerage industry, but, but the big picture is the same. Number one, and it's most important for every business, but probably even more so for a services business, like the business I'm in and the business Realogy and the franchisees and the independents are in, it's the people. Uh, without our people, we don't have a business. And your agents, uh, your independent contractors, your in-house uh, people that are on your payroll today, the most important thing is their health. And obviously our government is taking this very seriously uh, with all the closures that have happened uh, around the US, uh, but it's all about protecting our people. So um, I, these are you know, the first couple of things here are the things you should have already done. And, and, and I, I won't get into too much detail because clearly uh, you're in communication with your people by now, you're making sure they're safe realizing that they're experiencing challenges at home, working with their children screaming in the background and the dog barking and we all have a new norm. But at the end of the day, taking stock of your people and making sure that uh, they are safe and they're ready to come back to work uh, when, when, when you know, this, the, this, this stay at home is lifted is critical. So uh, it, that's kind of stating the obvious. Number two is uh, you know, the operational continuity and sort of the ramp down of your operation. And again, we're a few weeks into this now, so you know, are, are the lights turned off? Or is the trash being picked up? Uh, did, you know, John mentioned earlier, you know, mentioning that, you know, come in the office as little as possible. We don't want our people to get sick in our offices, but you also have to prepare your offices, your technology, and your business for coming back online, hopefully in a few weeks. So this is probably more important for manufacturing companies. If you have chemicals or things like that in the plan, or you need to make sure that it's safe, not so much in offices like ours that we work out of every day, but making sure that you're thinking about your business and that the doors are going to be open at 8 a.m. on Monday of hopefully a couple of weeks from now, and you're ready for business. I'll spend my time on three and four mostly, and that's understanding uh, what you can do. And John touched on some of these things, but to manage your liquidity. And I, I would say that um, you should, if you think you're going to be 20% down or 30% down, plan for 40 or 50. Um, cash is king in a situation like this. And, it, you know, making a cut, uh, you know, furloughing an extra week, not paying your rent, some of these things I'll talk about, I would overemphasize being a little more conservative maybe than you feel comfortable. I think as as, as you know, we're in the sales business as agents, and we're all probably more optimistic than maybe the general economy. Here, when you're managing your own business, though, and most of you are, are owners of your businesses, you, you need to take a conservative approach, because if you run out of cash, that's going to be a big problem. So I'll, I'll talk a little bit about that. And then number four is the funding. 
Um, and, and there's $2 trillion plus of federal funding and then a lot more funding at local uh, and, and state levels. And I'll just briefly touch on the couple of programs I think are applicable to uh, brokers on this call. Um, but there's thousands of pages of information and I have a team at my firm that's dedicated to this. So I'm not gonna be able to get down and too much into the weeds, uh, but I'll, I'll touch on the two programs. And then I'll, I'll touch on the last one now, uh, cause I don't think I have a slide for it. And that's pre prepare for an efficient return normalize operations, this crisis is going to get behind us. And there's going to be lots of opportunity for companies to grow beyond this. And unfortunately, some businesses are not going to make it, whether it's your local restaurant or, you know, all the way up to Boeing, right? Everybody needs help today. And unfortunately, some of them are not going to get enough help, or they don't have the dry powder or the working capital to get their business up and running. And some of those businesses may be, uh, you know, local real estate companies, that maybe uh, were not all that robust going into COVID-19. And certainly now this is gonna pose a lot more challenges. And that means potentially growth for many of you. And you know, saving jobs, rolling, uh, call them roll-ins or tuck-ins or acquisitions of other local real estate agents, that uh, agencies, brokers that you respect, that you've worked for, uh, worked with, uh, run into in your markets or beyond. Now is, it's not too early to be thinking about uh, acquisitions. And, and, and thinking about very good companies out there that otherwise would be doing just fine, but for this crisis. So be thinking about that now, be targeting them. Um, obviously we're all in this together, but you know, if we can save a business by rolling it in and working with other entrepreneurs, I think that's great. And we should be thinking about it today. So again, I'll, I'll, I'll just spend a few minutes on a couple of slides here. If we can move to the next one, please. So again, cash is king. I've already said this and we'll go to the next slide and I'll talk about just a few things we should be thinking about. So I, I call it the cash office. And um, many times businesses that are doing quite well, and we've been in a nice 10 year plus cycle of most businesses doing quite well, you forget about cash. Uh, you, you, you may have a lender, you may have a working capital line of credit. You may not, you may just have a bank where you have a bunch of deposits uh, that are building up and maybe you've been taking distributions for quarter after quarter after quarter and you've never thought about a 13 week cash flow, for example. You need to today. You need to be planning your weekly cash flow, your cash, your expected cash receipts. Again, I'd have a sensitivity model, probably 30 or 40 percent down, maybe 10 or 20 percent more than you think it's going to be, and managing your cash accordingly. Do you have a line of credit with a local bank or with a regional bank in your market? If you do, you might want to consider drawing on it, even if you don't think you need the cash. But there, there, there's going to be a need for working capital to relaunch the business. Cash flow coming in maybe a little slower than normal, likely will be. And having some what I'll call dry powder available is key. So consider drawing on a line. Um, approach your lender to free up trapped capital or in trapped cash. And what I mean by that is oftentimes there's a, a revolver uh, in place that's tied to some collateral, working capital or, or, or just fixed assets, for example. And you may have what's called an advance rate. So for every pending that you have out there, you may be able to get 50 or 70 cents on the dollar. And then when it closes, you collect and you pay the agent, uh, the commission and you keep the, the gross G, or the net GCI. Think about maybe going to your lender and saying, look, um, I need to get another five or 10% advance rate um, on my existing receivable or on my existing pending listings or on my fixed assets or my building that I own. So is there trap cash or trap capital available? Refinancing. Uh, those that are doing quite well, uh, there may be an opportunity as the banks come back online to actually get more cash. And some of that cash could be acquisition capital that you may use to find, you know, these, these distressed roll-ins or, or, or acquisition targets of other brokers. So it, believe it or not, it's, it's, some lenders are still lending money beyond the stimulus money in the SBA. So think about that. Um, a, f a freeze of hiring and a freeze in, in, in uh, uh, pay increases, bonuses, distributions, uh, non-essential expenses, maybe stay in the obvious. Some of the things John talked about, now's not the time to be giving raises to your, your corporate staff. It sends the wrong message to uh, your, your agents um, and, and you know, freezing some decisions that you would have otherwise made a few weeks ago, just for a quarter or so for the next 13 weeks is, is probably important. Uh, next slide, please. Okay, a, a lot of the, the same here, um, again, regarding the urgency of, of uh, keeping uh, dry powder and you know, keeping your, your, your foot on the pedal um, for, you know, generating cash. So you, you probably had some pendings that maybe slipped a little bit. 
Uh, do you have, you know, technology where you can do virtual appointments? And as John said, you're, you know, you're probably not doing a whole lot of open houses these days. And, you know, using social media and things like we're doing today, uh, webinars and things like that, but just trying to keep your velocity as, as high as possible in these terms to generate assets to dollars. And in, in this business, it's listings to pendings to dollars um, is critical. Next slide, please. Um, I, again, John, I think touched on a couple of these things, but um, I'll just give you an example. Um, our firm has a, a, a real estate group, not a real estate brokerage group, but a firm that, uh, or a group that deals in distressed real estate, enclosed malls, strip malls, commercial properties, et cetera, that go into default with lenders. And we oftentimes serve as a receiver. So we have, you know, hundreds of thousands of square feet sort of under management right now. And I talked to our guy that runs that group yesterday and he said the, the rent roll, they've kind of, uh, you know, gone through the rent payments that were due April 1st and 6% of their tenants made their rent payment in April. So, you know, I know you have a contractual obligation uh, to your landlords. Um, in many cases, uh, uh, you know, you may even know those landlords in the, the local strip mall owner or, you know, the standalone property and it may be a friend of yours. But again, cash is king. You may want to consider deferring that rent. Um, it's, it's high risk to some degree, but again, if, if, if my data point is consistent, uh, across most industries, 6% of the people that we deal with, now again, some of these properties are distressed, made the rent payment. So reduction of advertising, I think John covered earlier, and then exploring you know, other deferrals, including your bank. So if you've got a line of credit and you had a, a, a principal, quarterly principal payment due, uh, we might be a week late for that advice, but being proactive with your lender um, is critical. And um, you know, principal payments, um, I think are easier than interest deferrals. Because when you don't make an interest payment, it goes on something called non-accrual, which potentially could lead a lender to uh, call your loan in default. So that may be tougher. But again, lenders are all in this together with you. Uh, they want you to survive. And so, you know, being proactive with your lender and over communicating is critical. Next slide, please. So here again, I've got thousands of pages and I'd welcome anyone to, uh, to you know, reach out to me later and I can go into a little more detail. But by now, Hopefully everybody's aware that there's about a $2 trillion package, federal package that has been passed. And it's broken out uh, according to the following. It's about 600 billion of that is for individuals and families. Um, and, and that is important for uh, your independent agents, for example. So there is money available directly that us as American citizens can get. There's about 500 billion for what I'll call big business. Generally, people with 500 employees or more up to 10,000. Uh, the airlines are included in that. There's a $50 billion carve out for, for, for them. Probably most of us don't qualify under that section. And then there's about 375, call it 400 billion of small business loans broken up into two pieces, the PPP and the EIDL. And I'll talk about both of those in a second. There's another 340 for state and local uh, government. And then another about 180 to 200 billion for, you know, what's loosely called public services, hospitals, ventilators, things like that. I think what's most applicable to most people on this call are probably the two that I have listed here, both of which are under the, uh, being administered by the SBA, the Small Business Administration. The key here is you've got to access this money through a lender. Mm -hmm. And not all of you necessarily have loans. Um, and, and, and I'm sure most of you have banking relationships and maybe you just keep your deposits there and you make your payroll out of it. But those that have loans and relationships with banks and most institutions have an SBA component are jumping to the front of the line. Right. So hopefully by now you've reached out to your lender. Um, there are some lenders that as of last night still did not have their portals up and running, which is very discouraging. They're supposed to open Friday morning. I've helped many clients fill out these applications uh, starting Friday morning. I've seen a lot of spinning wheels <laughs> of, of, of you put in the information and you wait and there's no response. One I got a day later that said, we finally got your application on Saturday. And I know of one institution that doesn't even have their portal up and running, a fairly large bank. I've seen some creative workarounds. For instance, if you bank with, with bank A, but you're a private uh, bank client with bank B, so I'll, I'll make up a name, JP Morgan Chase is your bank, but Bank of America you happen to have wealth management with, if, if, if the wheel's spinning with JP Morgan Chase, go to your private bank and see if they can help you through their portal. And I'm not saying either one of those institutions is a problem, but you, you probably have have relationships with different institutions. And if you can't access one, go to another, apply through both. 
And if you get uh, you know, some of these uh, approved through both, you can always decline one, but it's not too early. It's actually you're late if you haven't thought about this already, given that it's Wednesday and a lot of these institutions were up on Friday. So access the money, even if you don't think you need it, I would, I would try to access it. You can pay it back early. Some of these loans are forgivable anyway. Um, so you should be trying to access the capital now, being that you're a small business. So let's just talk uh, pretty briefly about the, 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 the two different uh, packages. PPP, the one on the right under the SBA, is the Paycheck Protection Program. And basically there, it's for loans up to $10 million or the sum of about two and a half times your average monthly payroll costs. Now keep in mind, that does not include your independent agents that may be on 1099. So it's your average monthly payroll cost. Your agents have access to other, uh, likely have access to other forms of aid, but for you, you are gonna get up to $10 million or two and a half million dollars or two and a half times your monthly payroll to spend on things like payroll, like utilities, other debt obligations, rents, your mortgage payment, et cetera. So you can do the math based on your payroll. You can access that money hopefully fairly quickly and then use that money to keep your business running until we get back online full time. There's lots of stipulations. There's a 500 employee rule, but there are some exceptions. So again, I don't wanna get into too much detail here, um, but, but that money uh, should be, you should be most of you probably qualify. You should be trying to access that money now. The loan payments are deferred for six months and they can be forgiven. Um, and, and there's, again, there's lots of uh, regulations, but th they, they likely can be forgiven as long as you're using that money to fund the things that basically keep your business alive and keep your people employed. The next one is, and, and of the, uh, uh, of the uh, uh, roughly 400 billion, that's the big one, that's 350 billion of it. But as you can imagine, the line is getting long at these institutions. And we're seeing lots of applications not filled out accurately. And if you don't fill it out accurately, you're gonna get kicked to the back of the line. So spend the time, it's tedious, but if you don't dot an I or cross a T, your banker may love you, but they got a lot of people at their front door right now. So do your best to fill it out as accurately as possible. The next one is about 10 billion of it, of the, of the roughly 400 billion. And that's what's called the EIDL or the Economic Injury Disaster Loan. That one's on the left. This one's smaller, a smaller pool of money. It's, it's, it's limited to $2 million. The loans above 25,000 must be secured to the extent possible. This money I think can come a little quicker. Uh, there's some uh, bridge loan uh, uh, or, or, or fast cash capital that's available up to $10,000 uh, can be issued within three days. I've not seen a lot of success with that, frankly, in the last three or four days, but apparently it, there, there is a mechanism to get you a little bit of money quickly. So if you had an emergency payroll or your landlord was going to kick you out, uh, you, you'd, you'd want to try to access that quickly. Again, it's for fewer than 500 employees. Um, and there's, you know, low interest loans and, and long amortization and things like that. So you can actually apply for both um, as long as you use the money according to the, the, the regulations of both. So again, cash is king. I wouldn't try to limit yourself. I would try to access both. Um, and again, if you don't need the money, you can always pay it back. Um, so that's the summary in a nutshell. Again, I'd encourage you to read the guidelines. There's lots of, uh, uh, lots of uh, regulations. There's lots of uh, white papers out there, including my own firm has one, um, but that's the, that's the summary. And then again, lastly, um, we can go to the next slide. Um, this is just us. If we can help you, uh, let us know. But to close it all out and go back to what I said at the beginning, uh, it's not too early to be thinking about the good days, which, which will come back and thinking about uh, you know, being opportunistic for those companies that won't make it. Again, um, you know, they have really good agents, your competitors probably have really good agents and they probably have really good management and there's probably really good owners that unfortunately may not have access to some of the capital that you do or haven't access to some of these SBA programs. And uh, thinking of growth uh, during a time of distress seems a little bit outside the norm, but my opinion is it's not too early to be thinking about that. Super. Well, thank you. Uh, you know, for that overview. I just want to, for our audience, uh, maybe bring uh, do, do a, a couple of quick points here that you brought up just to emphasize them. I think it's these are absolutely key. And I'm just going to start at the end, which was 
you know, to put our mindset into that time period when we will go back to growth and we will go back to opportunities and we will look around and maybe there are some people who need to hear from us who we can welcome to join together with us who can come into our organization um, only for the best reason really which is to preserve their talent and their skill and their knowledge and uh, you know essentially uh, be stronger together as opposed to you know someone uh, failing apart I also loved your initial um, uh, your initial prescription which really is you know be looking ahead right I guess I remember a wonderful um, a wonderful a quote from a realty broker who once said to me, there's a reason why the windshield is larger than the rear view mirror, right? It's telling us where we should be looking. So look ahead as to what the next eight, 12, <clears throat> as you said, 13 weeks of cash flow look like. Review your inventory, review your cash flow needs, review your expenses, um, and obviously get help. Reach out to you know your advisors and your CPAs and your bankers and you know, and, and, and take a look at what the, the needs will be. And then last but not least, I, I, I think the, the key point in terms of the stimulus or the key point in terms of financial support, whether it's state or local or the federal level is, you know, get an application in now, get that conversation going, get your name on someone's list so that, you know, even if, as you said, the application has some, you know, misdotted I's and miscrossed T's, you're having that conversation because even some of the rules around these things are still evolving, you know, during during the comment period. So, um, you know, really good advice to to everyone listening, you know, to the 300 plus people on on today's session. Uh, re really good advice to be looking at these specific areas of operational, financial, and ultimately growth um, uh, uh, factors in, in our business. I do see that some questions are coming in, so I encourage all of you uh, who are watching and listening to continue sending them in. As I said, we will do our very, very best at the end to try and answer as many of them as possible. Uh, so we do appreciate them and we are collecting them uh, as we go. Um, I want to pop back to John for a moment here and sort of, you know, keeping in mind some of the things Steve has has advised us in terms of, of where we should be focusing, what effort we should be doing. You know, ultimately, um, at a time like this, there's a lot of things we can do in terms of, of repair and safety, but there's also still growth and momentum possible. Many of the uh, brokers uh, in the Realogy franchises are looking around and saying, you know, you know, what are the ways in which I can creatively continue to drive sales to maintain some momentum or even uh, uh, double down on some momentum. And I'm sure that's true of all brokerages in our industry, you know, doing their very best not to just act from uh, a, a, a point of frozen uh, operations, but of some momentum. John, what are some of the things that the brokers are telling you they're doing to continue to, uh, you know, drive sales, create the, possi the possible future pipeline that they'll need once uh, maybe some restrictions are, are loosened? You know, what are you hearing and seeing out there? Sure. Um, and, and Steve, thank you. The advice that you gave is um, perfect. And, uh, and, and uh, we agree 100%. And I'm not going to reiterate or emphasize it because I know we want to get to questions. I think there's a couple things that we're seeing, um, which is at a time like this, Matt, um, humans need to be um, connected and communicated with. Right. And it's a cliche, but, but literally, um, you cannot communicate enough with your employees and agents. And, you know, in terms of the cadence that we have here at Realogy, I report to our CEO, we, know, we have a 10 person leadership team, we have a touch base meeting every day at 9am and 5pm. For my leadership team in the franchise group, we have a touch base meeting every day at six o'clock. Um, our owned brokerages are doing virtual sales meetings, you know, with their agents, and they're getting attendance that is blowing away anything that they've gotten in, in, in normal times. You know, they're getting 75, 80, 90% of their agents dialing into these virtual sales meetings um, every morning. And so um, literally communication with your agents via video, via email, one-on-one -on -one phone calls should be as close to daily as possible. We've told every one of our managers and our own brokerage offices that they should be having a one-on-one -on -one phone call with each of their agents at least every other day. Um, and not go more than 48 hours without connecting with an agent. So, so the most important thing when we are, when we are quarantined is to 
is to create a sense of community in a way, in a virtual way, since we can't do it physically. Um, and, and that is super important. Um, Realogy uses Teams, which is a Microsoft product. Um, in the last four weeks since the quarantine has begun, we have, um, Realogy has hosted over 275,000 Teams meetings across our business, about 75,000 a week, right? Crazy. Uh, there are other tools as well, Zoom, right, which is a, um, a free accessible tool, Google Hangouts, you know, there are, there are um, uh, free tools like this that you all can be using if you're not. Um, you know, it's super important that your agents know how to contact you. They, they should have the, the phone numbers, um, email addresses, be able to text all of your employees and your office managers wherever they are. Um, and, you know, really pushing out um, the virtual tools. And what we're encouraging our agents to do is sort of two or three things, which is um, invest in all of the learning and education they can right now. Um, number two, to um, reach out and connect to their spheres um, and let them know that they're still here, share all of the advice that we're giving. So we have websites by brand where agents can pull content down around the virus or about saying safe or about how to see, how, uh, see homes at this time so that um, they, are, they are staying in, in touch. Um, and we're also telling our agents to let their clients know that because they're part of one of our brands and the Realogy Network that, that um, you know, this isn't our first rodeo. We've been through this before. We survived 9-11, we survived 2008, um, and that we'll survive this as well. And so I think it's an important time for agents to reassure their clients and for you to reassure your agents that, you know, you have the strength and the wherewithal to, um, to, to, get, to get through it. So I'm gonna, I'm gonna conclude with that, Matt, because I do, if we have questions, I think it's super important that we, we get to them. Cool. Absolutely. We do, we do have some questions. And uh, so I've got a list of some questions that we, we can jump right into here. And actually, I'm going to throw one to Steve because it uh, kind of dovetails with the uh, last part of his conversation. So there's the PPP and then there's the EIDL, the Economic uh, Injury Disaster Loan. One of the questions we have is with respect to the forgiveness, the forgivability of these. Are EIDLs um, uh, forgivable? Is there do we, do we have some guidance on that yet? We do have some guidance on the, on the PPPs, but have you heard anything there? Yeah, the guidance that the, the way we've interpreted is that no, no, first of all, you have to qualify, which you have to be credit worthy. And it can be as simple as your credit score. Uh, wow. The loans have a 30 year AM, so kind of like a mortgage uh, with, with an automatic deferral for the first 12 months. Um, so, you know, the, the government wants the applicants to be able to repay it, but they're pushing it out a year and they're making the money quickly available by simple means of a credit score, for example, or, or, or for, uh, in the case of businesses, other ways to gauge uh, whether or not something's uh, able to be paid. So, you know, where does it sit in the capital structure? Does a primary existing uh, lender, if you have one, a um, little bit gray on that area. Um, and I think there's kind of some good faith that you're going to pay me back someday, but the diligence that, that a bank would undertake, for example, and before they make you a loan is, is, you know, we obviously don't have time for that. So it is a loan, uh, but it's likely deeply subordinated. It's a long AM, and I think the government will hope you pay it back someday. Okay. All right. So that makes some sense. Um, John, let me go to a question that we had for you. Um, can you talk a little bit about what you're seeing from the brokers and the brand in general in terms of, of, of creating some business during this time and driving some listing and selling and referral activity? Anything uh, that you're hearing that you think would be you know, easily adaptable to any of the brokers listening to this session today. So what, what we're seeing is, um, is number one, sorry, the printer for our home is in my office and the college students um, who are doing their work are printing at the moment. So I hope you don't hear that. It's a loud printer. Um, uh, the good news is the college students apparently are doing their work. That's the that's the impressive part. Um, so you know we are we are seeing that um, agents and brokerages are getting very creative with social media, um, with um, video like um, uh, Matterport and things like that, and are getting um, very um, uh, ad adept at virtual showings, um, and we're seeing that you know closings. Um, are only off about 10%. Um, and there is still interest out there. You know, we are seeing that 
um, first time home buyers are taking advantage of the low rates. Um, we're seeing that uh, those who are fleeing large city hotspots like Boston and New York looking to rent starting in April instead of in June, you know, in the Cape and Nantucket and the Hamptons, the um, rental activity is um, increasing. So, you know, there are, there are um, pockets of, of opportunities to take advantage of, um, but it's really all about number one, video, and number two, staying in touch with your, with your clients and letting them know that you're still here. You know, I, and that's a, a wonderful point because I was just saying to a broker the other day, maybe two months ago, there were some few hundred thousand users of something like Zoom and, you know, that was good. But now there are tens of millions worldwide that have become instantly uh, adept at it, comfortable at it. And that creates opportunity for us to connect with them and, and talk about their future needs and their plans and to be able to still make those contact calls that are both personal and professional. Um, at the same time. So, so definitely using these tools. Steve, I have a, a sort of pair of questions that I think dovetail nicely for you here. One is, um, are, can you talk a little bit about other ways to obtain cash other than the CARE Act? Maybe some, just an example or two that's at a state or local level. And with respect to uh, the CARES Act, uh, PPP and EIDL, can you uh, combine your application for both? Of, like, can you get both? Can you get an EIDL and the PPP, how, how do they go together? Maybe you do that one first and then talk to us about other uh, uh, financial support resources that are out there. Sure, uh, yes you can, you, you have to apply separately, but you can apply for PPP and EIDL um, as long as you don't commingle the funds and use them for the same purpose. So as long as they're using, used for their intended purpose, right? So you two and a half times your payroll and you're using it to pay your rents and utilities and your people, and then you get the EIDL and you use it to pay uh, your health benefits or something that's completely different from what you're using the PPP for and it's not commingled. So yes, you can uh, apply for both and you should apply for both. And I think most of our uh, listeners probably do qualify for both. Um, so yes, the answer to that question is yes. As far as other aid, you know, I, I think there's more federal uh, aid coming. Uh, we're, we're hearing Washington talk about that every day. We're at 2.2 trillion already. Uh, but I'm finding, I, I live in Michigan and, and you know, the city of Detroit has made $3 million worth of small business loans available, for example, coming out of the city. There's trade associations for the restaurant, gr uh, restaurant group that we have locally that's being, uh, you know, other, that money used to be otherwise used for training and now is being used for you know, disaster relief type loans. So every, I've not followed, of course, every state and our firm operates, I think, in 17 or 18 states now. And we have experts in, in those states that know the local, uh, uh, the local aid available. But yeah, between uh, you know local government, uh, city, state, and federal, it's, I wouldn't necessarily just limit it to the 2.2 trillion or the two particular SBA programs that I briefly touched on today. Uh, there's there's other other things available depending on the local community that you live in. Yeah, and I guess uh, you know some good advice would be to get on those local and state government websites. You know, they probably all popped up a, a resource page or, you know, some sort of call out to what, what opportunities are there. Obviously, talk to experienced professionals like your organization, you know, who can get granular um, as well. Um, John, a question has come in here that I think would be, would be good for you to, to um, share some ideas on. Let's say I were a small independent brokerage and, I, you know, might be considering that a good way to not only get through this process, but to thrive on the other end would be to you know talk to uh, uh, you know one of the realty brand brokers in my in my neighborhood and uh, and to talk about how that we could merge or you know uh, be acquired by them you know and maybe obviously at this point I am having some financial struggles or whatever do you have any thoughts as to how best those conversations should be opened and maybe uh, pursued? Sure, I mean th those conversations can happen um, one of a couple ways, right? One is you can certainly reach out to your your uh, local companies, competitors, colleagues, friends, and and initiate that conversation yourself. Um, Realogy also has sixty five what we call them franchise sales professionals that are across the U.S. who um, are organized by brand and by market, and part of their job is to introduce companies to one another, usually an independent to one of our brands, because one of our brands is looking, one of our affiliates is looking to grow via, you know, merger and acquisition or things like that. And so we can certainly help with those introductions. We can help with the way in which deals like that might be structured. 
Um, and so, you know, you can reach out to, um, to us. I think, you know, we've, we've got the contact information um, via Jason or others, but if you're, if you're looking for help in terms of either acquiring a company because you, you think you've got the resources to do that and now is the time to take advantage of perhaps companies that are struggling in your market or you're struggling and think you, you would benefit from, from merging with another company, you know, reach out to us and that's, that's what we do. We, we help put people together. Super. Um, Steve, another question that's just scrolling across my screen here um, has to do with someone who uh, is either heard from their banker or is hearing and seeing online that, uh, they, that some banks are not accepting any more loans, that their queue is full or there might be some, some limits, um, demand was beyond perhaps what they anticipated. Um, you know, what would you recommend? Should someone uh, immediately look at another banker, someone on the SBA site who is who is in the program? Do you think that there might be an increase in funds coming? I, I think I may have seen a headline or two uh, to that. And any thoughts as to what I would do and, and how do I interpret the, the, uh, the, the signals that, that some banks have, have, have uh, cut off applications at this time? Yeah, if you think about, you know, banks aren't staffed, uh, even large banks in the world for, for this influx of, of, of loan, effectively it's a loan application, um, you know, within the SBA, many, most banks that I deal with, I deal with all of them uh, in, in, in my business, have some SBA component, but they've never seen anything like this before. So it's, it's hard to blame them, right? Just like our hospitals have never seen anything like what they've seen before. So we're all sort of trying to adapt. What I would say is don't, don't wait in line. Um, and, and hope that they're going to call your name down the road or that they're going to have availability for someone to help you process your application, go somewhere else. And I think if your lender heard me say that, they'd be mad at me, but um, I would not wait. I would, again, I think I said earlier, if you, if you, if you have a private banker or you, your investments at another, at another institution, I'd be calling them and uh, I, I'd try to get in line at another bank. Uh, I would not wait. Yes, there, there likely will be more than the 2.2 that's offered. I think this is going to dry up fairly quickly. There are hundreds of thousands of applications, millions probably out there by now. And uh, I, I joked about the spinning wheel, but on Friday morning, I was online with a fairly large company that I deal with, and we were filling out an application at a very large bank that I won't name, and it was just spinning and spinning and spinning, and we waited an hour, and we came back the next day, and it finally said, your application has been not approved, but we have it. That's so, yeah. You know, that was Friday morning when these things just opened up. It's now Wednesday. So there's probably a lot of spinning wheels out there at the moment. Yeah. It's and, what's, and what's a bit crazy is that um, it's, it varies all across the country, like you said, like you said, Stephen, by, and by bank. I, I know I've heard of affiliates who received approval and the funding already wired to them, um, yeah. you know, that was um, on Monday and they applied on Friday. Um, one affiliate in Omaha, right? It, literally on Monday, everything was approved, the cash was there. So it, it, it clearly is um, a bit inconsistent. But just to emphasize again, um, apply now and apply um, often um, right. to more right. than one source is I think one of the key, the key takeaways. Yeah, and definitely have that conversation, get those, get those key conversations open with your, with your lenders. I think this is a question for either, um, you know, maybe Steve, you, you could take a, a stab at it first from a financial perspective. One of our, uh, one of our viewers is wondering whether we should encourage broker owners who sell and agents to, to apply for unemployment and how that might impact uh, the broker owners, if they are collecting unemployment, if they're calculating uh, their loan uh, requests, you know, any thoughts around that? So this, I think, is a new aspect of this stimulus package that unemployment benefits are have a potential to be ex uh, extended out to independent contractors, 1099s in this sense. Any, any uh, things you're hearing or advice there? Yeah, I would say if you can access it, access it at this point. And, you know, again, ca back to cash is king. Right. It, it, will it count against you on the PPP? Will you have to bring some people back uh, potentially to qualify for some of these loans? Do you have to evidence? Because at the end of the day, the government wants us to keep people employed, right? That's why, you know, two and a half times salary uh, would give you a couple of months of runway uh, to, you know, pay your employees, pay your rents, pay your utilities. So it, it's all about, and at the, I didn't talk about the bigger loans. I work with a lot of bigger companies. The bigger loans are even more strict. Uh, if your company's trying to unionize, you must keep, uh, you must allow them to do that. You cannot right. offshore 
right? So if you're a manufacturing company, you can't move your production to China or, or Europe, for example. And so, and, you know, lots of strict regulations about keeping American jobs in America and, and, and keeping people employed. The, the, the smaller programs are not that strict and it's not even that applicable. Uh, but at the end of the day, uh, you know, they want us to use this money to pay our people. So we don't have a bunch of people waiting on the unemployment line. But that said, our people need to eat. They need to take care of their families. If they can access it now, well, we're, uh, if I were you, I'd worry about it later as to whether it counts against how much money you took out, whether or not you have to bring them back on board. Right. Do you call it a furlough versus a layoff? And I've got a lot of those questions. Uh, again, this is all evolving. Uh, nobody knows for sure but I would access as much money as possible that you can, and we'll worry about all that later. Yeah, I mean, what, one aspect of this is the interconnectedness of the economy. We've got to be able to have cash flow that enables our employees to continue to buy goods and services, pay their mortgages and rents, you know, which trickles to their landlord's ability to pay their bills. So, you know, obviously keeping the pumps going, accessing as much cash, as we can. One aspect, a follow up on that might be this question for you, Steve. Uh, do you, are you aware whether a broker can apply for PPP for the company and then also personally, uh, as long as they don't go above the hundred thousand dollars? Is there some uh, like dovetailing there? Well, the, the, there's a hundred thousand dollar cap. So if, if you're a broker owner uh, and you work at the company and you paid yourself a paycheck, you can do the calculus on, on your paycheck, get that money in and decide if you're going to pay yourself or not, uh, or, or your other employees and utilities and things that I mentioned earlier. Uh, so that, that, that's up to you. It's a, it's a math calculation. And then I could go apply separately. You're saying, um, I, I, I have not seen that. Um, I'm guessing the government's not going to want you to get paid twice. Um, but you know, if you can access it personally and then use your allocation within your company to pay other things, I think that's a wise decision and that's something I would, I hadn't thought about that, but I would, I would probably do that. Okay, cool. Um, let's talk about uh, this question, which has come in. Do you have any good options for uh, funding specifically for agents? We're afraid agents, you know, will get comfortable with unemployment and, and, and not earn on that income. In, in other words, the broker won't earn um, on that income. Um, any thoughts there? So your, your, your agents are sitting at home collecting unemployment and when the economy comes back, they're not motivated to come back to work and work for you and therefore I'm not going to collect GCI income? Yeah, that might be, yeah, that might be an angle on this question. It's, it's limited, so I'm just uh, passing it on. Yeah, yeah. Well, um, you could choose to pay them their full salary uh, by way of uh, your existing working capital in the business or some of this government aid, for example, which, which would be better than unemployment, right? Because unemployment typically is... Uh, is not as much as you would otherwise be earning. Right. Um, again, they're independent agents, so there's a, 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 you know, a different variable than if they were your CFO at your company, for example, right? It, you, you may really value that CFO and that CFO salary qualifies for the calculus. So you may not want that CFO collecting unemployment and not coming back to work when you come back into the office. So that, that's, again, I, I, these are interesting questions that I'm learning from. Yeah. I hadn't even thought about that. And, no, it's a tricky circumstance, right? Yeah. So we have to try and think through. Uh, let me actually bounce that a little bit over to John and then uh, do a follow-up. John, in a way that kind of goes back to your uh, recommendation with respect to, you know, just having good, strong and frequent conversations with your agents, knowing what they're thinking, knowing what their needs are, knowing what their concerns are, right? And making sure that whatever actions you take will not only help them through the crisis, but keep them healthy and keep them connected and obviously ready to come back into uh, the business when, when the, when, when times, uh, you know, when we have more freedoms to, uh, to be able to uh, uh, do showings and, and pick up our momentum there. That's right. Right. So, I mean, if I, if I understand the, the question, um, you know, when, when it comes to, first of all, they're independent contractors. Right. So we can't, we can't, um, do anything other than encourage or discourage them from applying for whatever benefits they're, they're, they're eligible for. And I'm not sure as broker owners, we would want to encourage or discourage them from doing anything because I don't know that we know what the right answer is and we may not want to be accountable for that. I think it's up to each of our agents as independent contractors and U.S. citizens to decide what they want to do. Um, I also believe that 
um, the benefits that are enhanced now will certainly go away once the crisis ends. And so the vast majority of them will be much better off coming back to selling real estate than, right. than on reduced benefits. That said, your point is a good one, which is, you know, we believe that the most important thing a broker can do right now is keeping your agents engaged. So even if their business has gone to zero, then um, having them uh, participate in your sales meetings, offering online learning, um, having them um, uh, boost and create their social media um, tools and plans so that they're ready to um, leverage that when, um, when it comes back. Um, prospecting, right? So all of their prospects are homebound at the moment. Right. Um, and many what of them are, are <laughs> exactly. And, and, and after three and a half weeks at home, we can't stand the sight of our loved ones. So we want to talk to other people. So, you know, prospecting is actually, you know, getting in touch with your sphere of influence right now is a good activity to do. Um, and again, it's human nature. People like to be just touch base and how you doing, you know, are you healthy? Doesn't right. need to be about real estate. So I, I think between investing in social media, in, in, in engaging with their sphere and prospecting, in offering education, there's a lot you as brokers can do to make sure your, your real estate agents remain in the mindset of being a real estate agent and so that they will come back to work when, when the crisis is over. And I think that that might be a good place for us to begin to wrap up here because in a lot of ways, what you're saying is that what people need from us now is more us. They need more of our presence. They need more of us just being there for them, reminding them that they matter to us, reminding them that, you know, we're there for them, but they are on, as part of top of our mind as our regular family. Because for most of us, our markets are our neighborhoods and our neighbors are our clients and our clients in this business, at least, they become our friends. It's a very unique business where in real estate, our clients become just part of our extended families. And in many ways, it's also why we're doing this, this session, right? Because while we are a great big industry of friendly competitors, we're also in a sense, part of that same real estate family, that industry that matters so much just to our neighbors and to our states and to our country and to the world um, as a whole. Um, I wanna thank uh, both of you, John Payton uh, and, uh, and, and Steve Weichel to, to Weibo to be with us here today. I, this was a hugely important conversation, a very insightful um, set of ideas and best practices and, uh, and, and tips for, for our audience. There were more questions, but we are a little bit running out of time. But I want to remind everyone who is watching that you can also uh, join next week uh, for uh, a session on Wednesday. And this time we will be featuring Coldwell Bankers uh, CEO, Ryan Gorman, uh, talking a little bit more specifically in terms of how to support our, our independent sales agents during this time and give them both uh, direction and uh, guidance as to how they can maintain momentum, be effective, uh, and, uh, and continue to pursue their goals and, and do good work. So once again, John, Steve, thank you so much for being with us. Uh, I want to also thank everyone, uh, more than 300 people who joined the session. And on behalf of Realogy for today's session, I'm Matthew Ferrara. We look forward to seeing you on the next webinar. Have a good day, everyone. Thanks, everybody.